After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be aware that this week is a momentous week at both of our seminaries, Concordia Theological Seminary and, of course, Concordia Seminary St. Louis. This week is the week where both the outgoing vicars, those third-year students, well, will be third-year students, uh, are placed in their vicarage congregations. Uh, going out not two by two, though, one by one, um, but to be paired up with another pastor, so I suppose it is two by two. Um, but of course, even more significantly, as the, those who have completed their studies and have been examined and have been uh, certified by the seminary faculty uh, to be eligible for a divine call, uh, will receive or have received their call, some tonight, I think some last night. And uh, it is a momentous time. And of course, the laborers are indeed needed. The harvest is plentiful. There are many, con- many more congregations requesting uh, graduates than there are, of course, graduates available. So the call continues to go out, like the Lord said, uh, for laborers, for his harvest, for pastors to serve in the congregations. And that's certainly what um, Jesus has in mind here in Luke 10. He's not yet called uh, into being the apostolic office, the office of, of preacher and teacher. But here he's doing that initial work of evangelism with the, the whole host of the disciples that have been following him. But we do learn something, of course, about the office of the holy ministry, as we call it, that which the pastors serve in, which is that they are to go forth and preach the gospel to every nation and to depend upon those who receive that word of peace, the word of sins forgiven and of course, the instruction for those who receive such a pastor that the laborer is worthy of his wages. But the real problem, of course, the real challenge here isn't so much the labor and his wages. That's what we usually get hung up on. Um, that's probably why many of those congregations that requested seminary graduates still probably won't receive one because um, their salary and benefits package is below a living wage, perhaps. Um, But that's still not really the biggest challenge that the churches face. The bigger challenge is that these preachers of the gospel go forth into congregations that aren't always willing to hear them. (laughs) And uh, without the hearing of the gospel, there can be no faith. And without faith, there can be no salvation. So it is even more important, not just that you take care of the pastor's needs, but that you also hear him, receive him. And this, of course, is a a learning process. Every pastor has his own kind of character or mode of speaking. Um, And, of course, you then are given to learn how to listen (laughs) to your pastor. I've been here five years. Maybe you're starting to figure it out, I hope, at this point. So the bigger challenge, of course, is both the preaching of the word in such a way that the people hear it rightly, um, distinguishing law and gospel and preaching and teaching the doctrine of the church uh, in accord with our confession. But also that you as hearers have open ears and that you're willing to hear and to receive it for your faith and life, that it instruct you and direct you, but most importantly, absolve you, forgive you in Jesus' name. And so there is both a promise and a threat attached to the sending of the 70 or the 72, depending on the account. And the the promise, of course, is that if you receive the one whom Jesus sends, you are receiving Jesus himself. What good news. Jesus isn't absent or distant from you, caught up into the heavens, and you have to go and try to find him, or hiding under every rock or behind a tree or on the top of a mountain or somewhere else, but rather he comes to you, and he does so by his word. He is the word made flesh, after all. A word that he attaches to signs, and that he puts within an office, within the office of the ministry, so that you can be confident that you, well, that Jesus is with you as you hear his word and as that word is proclaimed to you. But of course, then there's uh, the backside of that, the curse, which is if you reject the one whom Jesus has sent, you reject Jesus. 
And not only do you reject Jesus, but then you also reject the one who, well, who sent Jesus, which is, of course, God the Father. And so caught up in this ministry of the word is faith. Are you hearing Jesus? Are you hearing him for the forgiveness of your sins, proclaimed rightly? Or are uh, you rejecting that word when it's rightly preached and taught? At which point, of course, then it brings curses upon you because you're rejecting the one who died for you to save you. The problem, usually, though, isn't so much with the word that the pastor speaks <laughs> or even with the compensation package, as we said before. These are, the compensation package is, not, is really not that important in the big scheme of things. Just take care of your pastor. The word that he preached or even the manner or character or tone that he preaches uh, may be of issue, but it's usually not, at least in my experience. Most pastors that I've met preach faithfully and usually speak clearly and enunciate and um, speak it in a way that can be received for faith. But the problem is usually a question of authority. And this authority question um, has become quite contentious for us in our current cultural setting. We'll find that the uh, younger generation, we have a few of them here, not to point you out, uh, have even less of a trust in authority than uh, those maybe of the 60s and 70s. You remember when we were told to reject the man, right? Uh, and that we had a distrust of government because they certainly lied to us about uh, the wars that we were engaged in at that point and since. But today, that has escalated to the point where um, we don't trust any authority anymore. And that's even gotten its way into the church so that the authority of the pastor to preach and teach has come into question. And um, consequently, people aren't willing to receive instruction, a word spoken outside of them. Instead, they will say things like, well, faith is just a matter of me and Jesus. It's personal. Um, the church doesn't really get to tell me what to believe, for example. Definitely not the man standing in front. The problem with this, of course, is it contradicts the picture of the church that Jesus himself uh, proclaims in the Gospels, and then his apostles uh, further elucidate in their epistles. We heard one today from Ephesians 4, and it's really a beautiful picture, uh, but it's also for your confidence uh, in the authority of the pastor. Remember what he said, to each one of us, so that's me, that's you, um, that's those who aren't here that are part of our parish, those who are on our staff, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, Jesus appoints us each individually and gives us as is needed for the vocations he's called us to. Everything from top to bottom has been authorized and been created for the benefit of Christ both service to Christ, but also Christ to serve us. Hence, we heard about him descending and ascending. So from the highest places, that is the heavens, all the way down into the deepest place of the earth, everything has been structured for faith in Christ. And within that, that structure, which he describes then as a body, Paul does in many places, each is given to a, a specific role or vocation, a calling by God, and within that calling or vocation, then there is the promise that God will equip you for that work. Of course, the, the top then of the body, and that which directs and governs the whole body is the head, the head which is Christ Jesus himself. So the highest authority in the church is Jesus, of course, you could say. It's not the pastor, it's not uh, the congregational president, it's not the principal, it's the pastor. Not the pastor, I just misspoke, there we go. <laughs> it's Jesus, Jesus who is the head of the body. Jesus who has made his will known to us by his word, namely the Holy Scriptures. So to say that Jesus is the head is also then to say that the Scriptures are the sole rule and norm for faith and life. That is, it governs the whole Christian church. It governs everything that we do, God's word does, because the word is Jesus. And then, coming down from the body, there are individual members, and each member is called to specific vocations again. Some are called to be apostles. Well, 12 to number them. And then one, of course, departs, and another is added. Another two are added, actually, Matthias and St. Paul. Not everyone is called to be prophet, but some were. 
And you know many of them, they're the Old Testament prophets, and there's some in the New as well that are called the prophesy. The Old Testament prophets, you might know, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea and Joel and Amos and Obadiah. Remember the books of Bible in order, right? <laughs> uh, Nehemiah, Jacob, Zechariah is another one, right? You get into the minor prophets, you get a little lost. We don't read those too often. They have, were uniquely given for their time and place to, to speak God's word, uh, to proclaim, especially Christ who is to come. And now that Christ has come, of course, that, that role of prophet has uh, been set aside. Some are called to be evangelists, one of which we remember tonight, which is St. Mark, who was not an apostle, but was an evangelist. That is, he took the eyewitness testimony of the apostles and the other disciples and the women in particular, and he recorded that for posterity, for the sake of the church, that we would have the evangel, the gospel, uh, recorded and proclaimed to us. Um, some of the evangelists, of course, were also apostles, like St. Matthew and St. John. But St. Mark and St. Luke were um, helpers of St. Paul and were given then to record the eyewitness testimony and deliver it to us. And then some are pastors and teachers. Not everybody is a pastor or a teacher, but some are called to that. And then you. The, those offices were given specifically to equip you, that is the saints, for the work of ministry. And this is the aspect that I think we uh, often lose sight of, is that, uh, well, the pastor can only do so much. <laughs> and so usually the pastor is committed to preaching and teaching, but uh, what the first, the first pastors of the church recognized, those disciples, then apostles, uh, was that there was more work than there was, well, time available. And so immediately, at the beginning of the Christian church, you can read this in the book of Acts, those pastors appointed deacons, that is, fellow servants, deacon is a servant, servants of Christ in the church, uh, to go about the work of distributing alms to the poor and uh, to preach and teach as well underneath those pastors, and then also to um, deliver the sacrament. Um, to widows and homebound and that sort of thing. So they recognize that, well, when there's additional work, then there's additional calls. And this, of course, is all coming down from Christ, who is the head. So that all are equipped. And even you, within your vocations, whether it be um, as here of God's word now, God the Holy Spirit is equipping you for that work, or whether it's to serve in lay leadership in the congregation, or um, to serve uh, as a staff person, we have some of those, but also to serve in other ways, to volunteer your time um, or of your various talents or even um, of, your, of your wealth that God has given to you, but also to serve your neighbors um, in love and charity with the love and charity that God and Christ has given to you. All of this is for the benefit of the head of the body, that the whole body of Christ would be built up, that is to be edified, to its fullness and its stature. And so, um, of course, Christ is at work then today to build you up, to encourage you with his word and to, um, to direct you towards the support of the church as best you can within your vocation. And this is all, of course, for your benefit and for the benefit of the congregation. Um, because without this kind of building up, we're not, we're not sturdy, we're not strong, we're not able to withstand the sorts of, well, challenges that will come uh, in this world, that have always come from this world. What uh, Paul described as being tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. If we're, if we're lightweights, of course, we'll just blow away when whatever the new fade or, um, fad or whatever the new um, uh, challenges to our faith or even the attacks that come from what he called the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But instead, God is equipping all of us mutually within the vocations that he's called us to, to build one another up, to edify one another, to encourage one another, so that the whole body may be strong with its head, Christ, and then each supplying one another with whatever we need so that, well, of course, we have that full stature 
and uh, strength to withstand whatever attacks may come. So indeed, as Jesus said, the harvest truly is great and the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And thanks be to God that he has, that he has called me into the office of the ministry, you as, as members of this parish, and that he has given us a great work, a harvest to be about. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. Amen.